Hi there, and welcome back to another edition of Scale Up Radio, the podcast inspired by the entrepreneurial scale up system and designed to make navigating our scale up journeys that little bit easier by learning from others' experiences. I'm Kevin Brent, and in today's episode, I'm joined by Stephen Borwell Fox, an entrepreneur who's transitioned from running a service based company to acquiring Telecetra, a product focused business, in 2019. And Stephen shares his journey detailing the strategic due diligence that was involved in the acquisition, the benefits of a holding company structure, and the lessons learned in leadership. And you'll hear how focusing on individual strengths rather than trying to clone oneself and the importance of cash flow forecasting in seizing business opportunities have shaped his approach to business. And whether you're just starting out or looking to pivot your business model, Stephen's insights are bound to provide some valuable guidance. Make sure you don't miss any future episodes by subscribing to Scale Up Radio wherever you like to listen to your podcast. You can also nominate a guest for Scale Up Radio if you know someone with an interesting Scale Up story and you can find out how in the show notes below. So for now, stay tuned for a deep dive into navigating business transitions and optimizing company structure for growth with Stephen Borwell fox Welcome to another episode of Scale Up Radio. I'm delighted today to be joined by Stephen Stephen Borwell Fox. So, Steve, welcome to Skelet Radio. Hello, Kevin. Thank you very much for inviting me on board. Great. No, my pleasure. It's been a long time coming, hasn't it? We've been skirting around each other. So it's great to great to have you on. So you're the managing director now for Telecetera. So do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. Um, and to be fair, the skirting around has been me just trying to avoid <laughs> risk. Um, but I'm really glad I've made the decision to, to come on board and, and join you for this. So thank you. Um, so yeah, tell etc. Um, 2019, we had a discussion internally about software development because we were doing big software projects. And they, they're very lumpy. You know, you end up with too much work or not enough. Um, and it's services-based work. You know, when, when it's been good in the economy, it's been yeah. really good. But 2019, obviously beyond that, um, got really challenging. So luckily, we had a bit of foresight. And we said, what we need is a product where we've got recurring revenue and we've got um, a client base that we can continue to sell to and maybe upsell or sell them more licenses and then onboard some new customers. So we were looking around at different companies, different options. And then we'd actually met the directors of Telecetra without realizing it at Worcester University um, at, a, at a careers day there where they basically got the employers in to review the final year projects for the students. So I'd met Dan um, and Dan and Cecilia and they were basically um, at the other end of their career where they'd got a successful business and they were looking to retire. And the business was fantastic, really good products, really good client base, but it was really small. And the larger businesses they were trying to talk to just said the, the effort of the due diligence, basically, it, it wasn't justified on such a small company. Right. And the technology was a little bit old. So there was a bit, little bit of risk there. But it was a, it was a. And what was the so what is the service? What is Telecetera? So it provides a um, mobile app and a, a scheduling application. Um, and it's used by property maintenance teams, air conditioning engineers. Um, we've got telecoms companies using it. We've got people, if you go to Bristol or Birmingham Airport and use luggage trolleys, the company that maintains those uses our software to manage those assets and to repair and maintain. So it's repair right. and maintenance app. So it doesn't sound very exciting, but the customers we've got are fantastic. The UK, and we've even got some in South Africa. So it's quite, yeah. quite so, so it's really interesting little products and the customers they've got are incredible. So we acquired the company over a three month due diligence. And then by October, 2019, we'd, we'd got the company, we systemized it and moved it onto uh, zero and did sorts of other improvements to the business, put a help desk in place. So kind of the things I do on business, just the systems I tend to use, CRM systems, zero, moved to uh, uh, Lloyds Bank um, and just simplified a load of stuff as well, went paperless. And we did all that by Christmas. And then in January, February, 2020, I started visiting the customers to get to know them. Yep. Then of course, you know what happened after that. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I had to stop visiting all my customers yeah. and some of them to this day, I still not met. All right. Okay. Yeah. But as a product company, that kind of makes sense because I'm yeah. sure Bill Gates never met all of his Microsoft Office uh, users. Ab absolutely. And, and, um, yeah, it's one of the, the, this is one of the questions that people kind of raise an eyebrow when, when we ask, 
owners this, founders this, is do you know all of your customers by name? And the wrong answer is yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's bizarre. Um, so having come know, if, from a... If you're trying to scale your business, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're, very, if you're a boutique business and that's what you're about, that's fine. But if you're yeah. trying to build a scalable business, you can't possibly be the one that knows the names of all your customers. No. And so that was absolutely right that we'd gone from a services-based business where everybody wants to talk to me we had customers coming in between projects and they were chatting to the team. And then I'd come in the meeting room and just say, hi, then I'd leave. And they say, where are you going? And I say, well, you don't need me. You need the team. So on services-based projects, the customers tend to want the business leaders involved in their projects. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to get away from that. I didn't want to be the single point of failure. And if I'm away, then the customer goes, oh, you know. So moving to the product thing is fantastic because now we get in touch with our customers just randomly and just phone them and say, how, how, how's it going? How are you? Uh, by the way, did you know this? Or we've added this feature. Would you like to give some advice on it? So we're now proactive at our choice. And the customers are like, wow, you guys are really amazing. We're like, well, no, you're amazing because you pay every month for our software. You use it. You don't call, a lot of them don't even cause us any trouble on the ticket system at all. Yeah. Um, most of the tickets we get are actually feature requests or, hey, how do you do this? Or could it do that? So it's an absolutely fantastic uh, application and set of clients. So it's a huge opportunity for us to gradually, slowly scale that. Brilliant. Excellent. So take us through then. So, so what, sort of, um, what sort of stage is, is the business at? You know, if we look at a scale-up journey, you know, give, us a, give us an idea of the, of the stage you're at. So we're basically ready to scale it, but I think slowly because yeah. I don't want to throw a load of money at it, a marketing and sales team. It would have to be huge to do that. So what we're focused on is the old software, the customers are coming off that and they're going to the cloud-based uh, solution. So what we've done through 2020 to 2022, we've rebuilt the software as a mobile app and as a browser-based application, what we call a web application. Yeah. So most people would be familiar with it. You go to your bank, Tesco, Sainsbury's, eBay, LinkedIn, they're all running the browser. You don't have to install any software, any plugins, it makes it really easy for the end user to, and you don't need training courses because if they had to provide a training course to use Lloyd's Bank or Sainsbury's or eBay, they kind of failed, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. It's true though. And that's what, yeah, I, yeah. that's what I use in the office every week. I say, if we make it complicated and we have to do training, we failed. Okay. So we have that sort of mantra of like keeping it simple, really, really try and keep it simple. So where we are is switching customers from the old software to the new web application, the mobile app. Any new customers that come on board, they just go straight to the new software. I mean, it's just, it's really just simple. Um, we also integrate it with things like SAP and there's like housing platforms and um, ERP systems. So we've got a load of open AIs that allow the customer to interface with us, or we can use our own APIs to interface with their systems. We don't mind either way. So, and, and again, that makes it sticky with the customer because they're integrating their system with ours um so i'd like to the economy at the moment is challenging this year and last year so but i'd like to be in a position by autumn or january at the latest to be taken on some kind of marketing salesperson do a bit of lead generation i've been doing a lot of work on the uh, website and marketing and a few targeted exhibitions mainly for research purposes really um, so when this person joins me, I can say, right, here's our marketing plan. Here's the exhibitions and events we typically have been to. Literally, here's the keywords that we use on LinkedIn. Here's all the keywords for the web pages and the SEO. You know, here's the tools we use. Have a play with this for two or three months, and then let's let's do something. Yeah, so I'd love really. to get somebody on board to support me in the marketing and sales again, because I'm the single point of failure of that now with this new business. So I need to. To kind of divest that responsibility to somebody else really and what does the team what does the team look like how many people are in the business so there's six of us in total in telecetra and then we've got another company a cybersecurity company we span out last year and there's four in that company so there's 10 of us in the office we all share the same office in Fourgate street in worcester um, so i'm the md and then i've got basically uh three really good uh software developers um i've got a t-level student as well who is really very capable i mean he 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 only works one day a week uh and he works on the actual product you know yeah. so really and it's compliment to how college heart was to college that they they identify students for us for work experience and we give them a week's opportunity and most of them to be fair at the end of the week we pretty much offer them a job 
Yeah. Uh, and then they work part time one or two days a week while they do their B tech or H and D or T levels. And they've worked for us two or three years part time before going full time. Okay. Very good. And and you mentioned that you've so you've got those two companies then. So we were talking a little bit before we came on air, you know, tell, tell us how you've structured the business. Yeah, so we we looked at the bigger businesses and how they do things and they're always acquiring and merging and doing this stuff. So obviously you know, I'm an electronic engineer. I'm a software engineer. I'm not a business person. I didn't do a business strategy degree or any of that stuff. So over the years, you learn these things. What's a group company? What's a holding company? So I spoke to a few other tech businesses, and one of them had set up a group company that him and his wife owned, and they'd got a main business they put underneath it, and, the, and then they were spinning out this other business, very much like we'd done, gone from a services business to a product business. And they wanted to hire people in, and they wanted to keep its identity separate. So rather than two, running two companies alongside each other, they put the group company in place and then set up the new product company. And then he said to me, and this is a technical person, right? It makes you think about where you put the money from the profitable consultancy company. Do you leave it in that and reinvest in that? Do you move it to the group company and leave it there as a bit of a cash reserve? Or do you then take some of that, invest it in the new company, but not all of it? So he said, it makes you think about moving money between pots and how much you're prepared to risk. And when you make profit, you take some of it back and move it into the group and go, okay, it's there for a while. We'll use that in the future. But in the meantime, you've got some cash reserves. So we've got a group company a software product company um, and a cybersecurity consultancy company. And both those companies are separate, um, separate bank accounts, separate companies, separate websites, email, everything is completely separated. And the idea is say the cyber company grew and grew and grew and they go, do you know what guys, we actually, we've got an office with nine desks and 10 employees at the moment. So we can't actually fit everyone in anyway. If they outgrew our office, they could go and move to their own place without any impact on our network or security or website or any of that stuff. And also if I hired another director or investor or co-director or, you know, something or CEO to take over from me, I could make it really clear that that's the business I want you to look after. Yeah. And it enables you, I guess, as well to incentivize perhaps using share options within one yeah. of the yeah. training companies and not mix it all up in, in yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And focus, as you said earlier, I'm ticking off one of my bingo words here, focus. <laughs> so it would give focus to me and that yeah. person, but also that person would, to be fair to them, they'd know they were focused on the software product or the cyber thing, not, well, I'll go out with different business cards and try and sell, you know, bits and bobs. So yeah. that's, that's really important. Yeah. And, and do the businesses, do the two trading parts rely on each other for, for various things like IP or, or and things, or, or, or are they just completely separate? They're completely separate, uh, which is the right thing to do. However, sometimes a cybersecurity customer, say they do a penetration test on a, a company that are writing a software application, yeah. they'll find some recommendations. If it's a really small development team, they might come back to and say, could you help us with the remediations? So then Telecetra can support Cybex with those remediations. Um, and the other is true. We're building software for customers. Um, and we might say, actually, um, they, they ask us about something to technological security. We say, well, we should refer in our cybersecurity co-company, our sister company, and they can do an independent review of this, that, and the other. Sometimes we go to a customer and we offer up both services. So sometimes Cybex leads the customer offer and sometimes yeah. Telecetra leads it. But they are they are kind of you know mutually exclusive. Um, but they are complementary, very much so. Brilliant. Are there any any downsides that you've come across of having that structure? No. And I think what I'd like to do in about a year or two's time, I'd like to set up an IT managed service provider, an IT MSP. And we've got a young guy who's about to graduate um, who loves all the tech stuff, anything with flashy lights on. And he's a really practical guy. If things break, he stays completely calm, investigates it. And within 10 minutes, he's fixed it. And then normally he goes, actually, while I was there, I fixed these other things as well and tidied this up. And there was a spelling mistake. And da, da, da. So he's really diligent and very calm. And he just seems to be really capable. He also does a lot of maintenance on his own car. So he's one of those practical people <laughs> right, that's yeah. not afraid to take stuff apart and just fix it and yeah. make it better. Yeah. So he's got a good mind set for it so i would like him in about a year or two's time to be working on an msp so we would have a, an it support company we'd yeah. have a software company and we'd have a cyber company and effectively any any business that's using computer technology do you know any of those um, <laughs> <laughs> any of those we could refer into one of the three businesses yeah, yeah. 
good. And there's there's something else as well about the that whole strategy, which which is so you you mentioned focus and a few other good things. It, it also gives some protection, doesn't it? There, so that if if uh, if if you've got IP, that enables mm-hmm. you to define exactly who owns the intellectual property and, and, and yeah. where that sits. But equally, just as you said, if if one of the businesses goes really really well that gives you options but equally on the on the flip side if one of the one of the businesses doesn't go so well it doesn't necessarily drag the whole the whole group down no, and the other right. business with it as well so it separates yeah. it all from that that perspective and the protection so good excellent all right so what did you learn from doing an acquisition because i think that was your was that your first acquisition technically no no actually ah. so the group company is called koyos group and um, my friend Case, uh, who still works with me as an associate today, he's a brilliant guy, actually. You'd, you'd get on really well with him. He's Dutch. So um, he um, very strategically minded, like me, yellow, extrovert, looks at every problem completely opposite to everyone else. So he and I get on brilliantly. And everyone goes, where, what are Stephen Case doing? We're, we're going off in one direction, <laughs> asking different questions while everybody else is trying to fix something that clearly is never going to be fixable. Yeah. yeah right. So we're, we're like um, challenging st- sales style, you know, because we, okay. yeah. why, do, why do we even need software? And the customer's like, what? I go, well, forget software. Well, why, why are you trying to do this thing? What's, what's yeah. really going on here? Yeah. You know, yeah. and you get to the bottom of, oh, we've just bought this company with a warehouse and dot, dot, dot. Right. Okay. So, but they never tell you the backstory. They just say, we need some software that does this. Okay. Yeah. And you get, tr- they try and laser focus us down onto it, but they don't realize that actually the problem lay somewhere else. I'm sure you've seen it with, with Bismarck, with your. Well, we see it with businesses all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you cure the, you cure the headache, but actually what's the, what's the, well, you give a pill for a headache, but yes. what, what's yeah. actually caused the headache in the first place? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so people with tech, they're very guilty of like buying a hammer because they want to hit something, you know, and yeah. um, buying a screwdriver because they think that's what they've always used. And, oh, we had a helicopter and it broke, so we'll buy another one. So why do you even need, you know, so tech is is really guilty of talking about tech and for tech's sake, not okay. the business challenge and the, the thing there. So Case ran a company called Coyos Group. And he actually set it up a year after I set up my first business. And when Andrea, my, my lovely wife, found out, she said, oh, if you'd have known that, you'd have joined them. I said, well, I actually would. I, I, I went off on a software engineering business and mm-hmm. started scaling that. And Case went off on a more consultancy-based uh, business. Um, but we worked together many times through, through sort of about 20 years, from about 2004 to literally the current day. Then the, we worked on two projects that were Coyos projects, and they became more software-y from consultancy. And they got to the point where the consultants were like, look, yeah, we're, we're doing access databases. They want web pages. It's, it's technical, so core steep. So we got involved with that. And then they had some business dramas. And in the end, um, the business fragmented. And there were two projects that we were supporting as a subcontractor. And I spoke to the um, – Case was the MD – and then there was another director called Alan and um, spoke to him. And I said, look, we're doing these two projects. And he said, we need to novate these contracts to your company. And I said, well, these two customers are quite big organizations, the risk involved, and they'll just recompete it all and we'll lose all the work. Uh-huh. And he said, well, that's a real shame because he said, you're doing a great job. Both these customers love the work you do. They know you're doing it as a subcontractor through us. Um, and, 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 I, and I, he said, well, what, what are we going to do? And I said, well, have you got these customers? Yes. And he said, what about these? They've gone that way. So all you've got left are these two customers. I said, well, what we could do is we could just take over the business because if the only two customers in the business being serviced and we're supporting, mm-hmm. we could just take the business on and run it on and still subcontract to it. So there's no disruption to these two customers. And he said, well, he said, well that, that would work. He said, what would you need to do that? And I said, I presume you've still got money coming in and going out from previous contracts because there's always a lag, isn't there, in cash flow. Yeah. You finish a project, but payments are always another month or two and there's yeah, bits yeah. and bobs. And... If you're lucky, yeah. <laughs> if you're lucky, right, yes. Yeah. Um, so that's what we did. He said, well, what do you need? And I said, well, I just need access to a cash flow. And he said, well, we haven't got one. I said, well, <laughs> number one is to do a Steve weekly cash flow forecast which I learned from Goldman Sachs and Aston University. So that's another skill I, I developed over the years that I'd never had a cash flow. Yeah. So I was challenged to create a cash flow forecast to convince Matt Davis from Aston University that I didn't need a cash flow forecast. <laughs> right. Okay. 
challenge accepted i get it okay since then we've had cash flow forecasts so um so i put together a weekly cash flow forecast with all the customers and all the outgoings um and he gave me access to the bank within a day or two and for three months we basically met weekly looked at the cash flow looked at the income and expenditure things married up that money came in goes to those contractors that goes in pays that and gradually it got thinner and thinner and thinner until the only things going in and out were the two customer payments for our two piece of work we were doing and our invoice monthly for those two bits of work at which point we were like okay so how do we want to to do this so basically he said well you saved me like two years of hmrc letters and winding a business down and tax and this and that so he said basically there there is no value in this business he said so he said i'll just sign the shares over to you right so it was an acquisition for zero pounds very good that's so we transacted those two contracts for a few years. Then we took them on uh, on our main business. And then we we're at the point where we were going to dissolve that company because it was effectively nothing going on. And Andrea, to her credit, said, couldn't we use that as a group company before we dissolve it? Because isn't that a good thing to do? And I was like, actually, do you know, that is actually a really good idea. We've got this company. Yeah. If we dissolve it and we set up a new group company in two or three years' time, yeah, we've got a company with no credit, no trading history, versus one that's been going since two thousand and four. Yeah. So, so it was Andrea's idea. I spoke to our accountants, got the advice. I went, yeah, you just make that. You do this share swap thing in yeah. all that magic, and that stuff doesn't interest me at all. I'm not interested in all the finances and things. Um, so they did all that, sorted it out. So we've now got a group company that owns the Telecetra software product company, and it owns the, in fact, it owns eighty percent of the cybersecurity company. Because when we spent the company out last summer, the two senior guys out of the four, I made them directors and shareholders and gave them equity in the business. Right. So, so they're 31 and 28, and they're both company directors. And one guy was really chuffed because he said, my name's on company's house. He said, that's like a, a lifetime achievement for me. He said, it's incredible. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So they're excellent. So, but, so the tele, the tele Cestra was a, was a, Full acquisition, though. Yeah, yep. we paid money for that. So, yeah. so what have yeah. you what have you learned about doing doing that? So, it's interesting because it's a bit like buying a house, okay? And when you look at it, it's completely mad, right? So, it was the most expensive thing you buy in your life, isn't it? A house. Yeah. Okay. So, it's the most expensive thing you you go to a solicitor, they do the conveyance in, okay? And every house we've bought has had some kind of challenge or problem with it right yeah and all the solicitors do look at the paperwork they never get in the car and drive to the house and go oh that's the wall that's got the crack in it oh that's yeah. the neighbor's thingy oh i can see where that joins this and why the drive right okay so i learned exactly the same with the the, the people doing the due diligence for us it was all paper-based they never this is the company. They never spoke to the current directors. They never spoke to the customers. Now, if you and I were going to go and buy a car out of a magazine, yeah. we would drive to the other end of the country, test drive the car. Yes, we might look at the service history, but they wouldn't send us the service history in the post for us to read and send back and say, yeah, we'll buy it. <laughs> You would physically see the car. You would physically drive it. You would open the bonnet. You'd check the oil. You'd probably take your father-in-law or dad or someone with you. You might even pay the AA to do a 100-point test on it because I'm not an expert at buying vehicles. So what I learned was due diligence is great, but you, you have to, in parallel with the, the legal stuff, really you've got to meet weekly with the business owners and get to know yeah. the what are the customers, what are the products, what are the challenges, how do you sell this thing? You know, you and these guys were really keen for us to take this on and continue the the good work and not make a a kind of you know ball of chalk yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, so I think my lesson is when I'm ready to sell one of my businesses, I would be proactive and honest to them and say, right, come and meet me every week on the same day for bring your team in. So one of my software guys sat with one of their guys every day, and I sat with the two directors and talked about sales and marketing and strategy and you know what do we. What do we really need to worry about? Which are the customers that we need to see more than others? And what are they expecting? What are they worried about? If you two retire, right, what, what are they losing? And how can we kind of reverse that and turn it into an opportunity and say, oh, you're now backed by this big software company and a cyber team rather than two or three staff who are sort of keen to retire. Um, so there's a lot of learnings there about how to do due diligence technically as well as the legal and the two need to be done in parallel
Okay. And this was this was with people that you knew and you already had a certain degree of trust with and they and like yeah. like with you. Yeah. So I guess the question there is you're you're opening up um with those conversations and and all sorts of things could be shared. What protections did you put in place just in case one of you decided actually we're not going to continue with this? So we said we said to them, they were like me very much no bs okay so I, i'm very straight back you know where my heart must leave and to my detriment uh, and andrew and i were talking about this the other day actually how things have happened to us in life and it's because we've been honest um that we've been walked on or trampled on or people have exploited us in some way however we sleep at night and we go well okay somebody's trampled on us to get higher up the ladder but somebody else will knock them off or they'll meet a bigger bully won't they yeah, yeah, but it's not us. So we just keep out their way and go, okay, stand on our shoulders, climb up and yeah, okay. And then to be fair, they're then out your way, aren't they? They're like, okay, yeah. they're gone now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so I'm really honest. And and Dan picked up on this really, really early. The facts were super honest. And he said, I'm as honest as you. He said, but I'm not very good at articulating it like you are. He said, you're a bit more charming about, you know, when you say no to people. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so um, which is, which is really honest. So we, so we did, we, we met weekly and I said, look, every week the answer is no until you convince us that actually let's do another week. So I said the, the default roadmap through normally I'm a yes. I'm an engineer. I go left yeah. to right. Yeah. And the default pathway is left to right, straight across, and then out the other end. Yeah. And then there's a few exceptions that might occur along the way. But generally, the process goes left to right, da -da -da -da, through, across like that, right? But this process was everything was no by default, okay. unless it was like, convince me, and then we go yeah. back to the yes path and okay. through. So again, yes. that would be my recommendation for people is assume that you do one more week and then it's a no. Yeah. yeah. Are you prepared to put time and effort into it? By the way, your own business, obviously you're taking your eye off that ball. So, you know, you don't want to risk everything yeah. ch chasing this new thing. So the answer is no, unless you convince it's yes, and then we do one more week and then one more week. Um, so that that was just my kind of I think that's a, protective. Oh, that's a really, yeah, that's a really interesting interesting way of looking at it. Um, certainly you know the, the the one for for me there is the is the no rather than the yes we, we assume that it's not going to happen so let's prove it and make it make it find a reason to make it happen it's like it's like with an it's like with recruiting an employee i suppose in a way you want to you want a hell yes rather than a mm, okay maybe but i'm a bit doubtful some bit so so there's that the other the other there that i might liken it to is a lot of us as business owners drift into growth or drift into trying to achieve things or, or but we don't set ourselves those those go or no go decisions yeah. and and if we're doing something that something that's a bit of a change then that's what we should do if we're investing in a new marketing approach or something like that there should be a milestone which is okay what's it going to take for us at that point to decide to continue or to stop um, and then stick to it rather than getting there and going well it's sort of worked so do we continue or not? Yeah. Um, so yeah, good. I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist and I'm a very positive person. So I'll tick off positive. Um, and Andrea, you know, Andrea, fr I frustrate her because I am such an optimist. I mean, I'm obviously deluded optimist. Okay. So when I was in that situation of spending effectively a, a lot of money and time, potentially, um, I was like, I need to kind of reverse my yellow self into a blue analytical self. Yeah. Yeah. which I'm not blue at all, by the way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and Andrew joked me the other day saying about all you do all day long is color in spreadsheets. I said, no, no, no. I said that I use conditional formatting. They color themselves. In. <laughs> Honestly, I, I update our cash flow in the morning about two or three minutes and I'm done. I'm like, that's yeah. it. Right. Yeah. Like, so my worst nightmare is someone selling, sending me an email with like lots of spreadsheets attached to it saying, please, could you spend four years analyzing this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would literally run out of the building opinion, screaming. Yeah. 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 So I, so I had to make myself blue. Yeah. And we can, as business leaders, you, you can change into those four colors when you need to. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm investing money and time in this. Uh, and so I need to make myself blue and look at everything analytically. And I thought, well, if I was an accountant there and the lawyers, they always say no to everything. Should we buy this house? No. Should we buy this property by the seaside? No, there's a crack in the seawall. Say no. Right. We've had that ourselves. Yeah, right. Yeah. You get talked out of it by the professional services people because they're just risk averse. Everything's no. Yeah, yeah. So, so when I deal with these people now, I say the answer's yes. 
okay, how do I get and buy this business? Or how do I make sure that when I buy this business, I know what all the risks are? So, um, and I just spoke to other business leaders and said, if you were buying a business, what questions would you ask? Or if you've bought a business before, what what surprised you and what disappointed you? Yeah. 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 Yeah, which is kind of what I'm doing here on the on the on the podcast, really, very much, very much like that. <laughs> so, so in terms of how did you approach? And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to get to how much you paid, but but what? How did you approach the valuation as to what that company was worth? What you were prepared to pay? What they were prepared to accept? How did you approach that? Yeah. So, I I said to Dan, I said, "What do you think this business is worth? What do you what what are you looking for for this? You know?" Um, and he said he wanted. Um, a particular number and it was based on the EBIT, you know, for effectively the net profit per year. Yeah. Okay. And I said, well, that's completely reasonable. Your income, he'd give me all the numbers, all the turnover, the profitability. Um, and he said, it's pretty stable. Um, you don't lose many customers. You gain occasionally gain a new customer. Um, and he said that that's what we want. And then what we did is we agreed to about three months of due diligence. And like I said, the answer was no, 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 no. And then we got 12 yeses and we're like, okay, we're, we're happy with the tech. We're happy with the sales, the marketing. You've given us things if we were going to buy. So look, go back to the car thing. If we're going to buy this car off you, what would you do? Oh, I'd have actually updated the exhaust because, you know, you're probably better off. Da, da, da. So trying to get some tips off people, if they were going to keep the house or the car or boat or whatever you're buying, what would mm-hmm. they do? And again, most people are fairly honest. They say, well, actually, you just need to do this yeah. and do that. And yeah. that if, you had a, if you had a bit of money to invest, what would yeah. you, yeah, what what would you, you do? do? What would you do? So yeah. they gave us loads of ideas about that. So we, we got to the point where we're there. So we paid a small amount of money on the signing of the contract to make it like we're skinning the game. Mm-hmm. And we had a savings account with some reserves in. So we used pretty much all of that. It wasn't, I mean, I'm talking millions here, right? Um, <laughs> so we paid a, an, an amount of money up front to them to, to show that it was, it, we were serious, okay? And then we spent the three months uh, basically working with them to, to take over CRM systems and accounts and bits yeah. and bobs and IT. And then what we agreed, we agreed to do eight quarterly payments out of the cash flow. Okay, great. So, so I sort of suggested this. I said, would we be able to pay, some businesses do a payment plan. And I said, would we be able to do something? They said, yes, yeah, absolutely. said, we want you to succeed at this. So we want you to get to the point after two years, you've made eight quarterly payments because you've been able to, because you haven't lost customers and you haven't screwed the business up and things haven't gone wrong. Yeah. And then you're, you're effectively solo. You're, you're free to fly after two years. Yeah. And that's what happened. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. So any, any final things, what would you, anything you would do differently uh, during that process, if you were to do it again, I think I probably. Oh no, we did go and see. We we asked for what the top two or three biggest customers were, because from a revenue perspective, I mean they've got some customers have got two hundred licenses, some have got like five or six. Yeah, mm. uh, and you're talking you know thirty, forty, fifty pounds a month per user, sort of license, typical license cost like that. Um, so I think we did. We went to see the top three customers. Um, mm. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd do differently with the lawyers, I would ask them more questions to, to get them to do uh, more kind of technical questions. And they must have some. They were just looking at contracts and this and that, right. and, you know. But I, I think they they probably have got the skills that they could talk to one of the customers and ask about, you know, why do they use the software and, and how what else do they do with it? And if they didn't use the software what would their choices been what decisions would they have made how would they have bought an alternative so so i think the lawyers could have done a bit more towards the technical i'm not saying looking at source code and technology the customer due diligence yeah i think just probing them and then the customer might have said oh well we're not really clear about the terms and conditions actually because we we signed this software up five years ago and we don't know if the terms are still the same or is it different or you know so they might have had some basic questions about slas Oh, what happens on a Friday night at midnight if the software stops working? Yeah. I don't think anybody would have been able to answer that clearly by pointing to, oh, yeah. section 12 of the SLA says, da, 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 UK yeah. business hours, da, 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 whatever, you know? Right. Good. Okay. So you you acquired Telecetra in 20, 2019. You, you, you weren't, you're not a business virgin at that point. You've been in business for a number of years. How did the how did the how did the pandemic affect the existing business that you had at that time? So, we 
obviously we were watching, I was watching the Andrew Marr show on the Sunday mornings every day through, um, through sort of the autumn. So I tend to walk the dog on Sunday morning early uh, and then come back and watch the Andrew Marr show and just catch up with all the news. But he was quite good at articulating it in a sort of non-biased way. So in one hour, I could catch up with all the key stuff and go, right, that's where we are. And he had really good guests on there talking about the economy and interest rates and all that Brexit stuff that was going on. And um, so you could see that this kind of China flu thing was being talked about more and more every Sunday. And it was like, oh, this is coming. This is. And I said to Andrea, I said, as soon as this gets to Heathrow Airport with people, it, it, that's it. It's yeah. if you've seen the film Contagion, you, yeah, you know, yeah. which I, I've seen it several times. You're like, it's basically once it gets to someone on a flight, that's that's it. It's yeah, it's yeah. global. Yeah. And Heathrow Airport, that's that's it. Within three or four days, it's everywhere. Um, so what we did is about middle of March. In fact, I can remember the date, 9th of March. I watched Andrew Marshall on the Sunday and I, on Sunday night, I couldn't sleep. My mind was racing going, this, this is coming. This is like, this is like, and the, the analogy I use with people is like, we're all sunbathing on the beach. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Steve gets an alert that there's a tsunami coming and Steve starts gathering bottles of water and jumpers and parasols and bits of food and plastic bags to put coats in and gathers things up. And people are watching me going, what's this crazy guy going? It's 30 degrees. He should be sunbathing and just chilling, drinking cocktails. But he's collecting stuff, taking it up to the hills and coming back again and collecting twigs off the beach <laughs> and watching me work, scurrying around like busy ants, taking and it's like, guys, there's a tsunami coming. And no, it's all going to be fine. You know, it's great. So I was very much in the mindset, hey, I think we need to prepare for this. I think this is, this is real. This is happening, you know? Mm. Um, so we, early in March, we, and we always worked from home one day a week, right? So we've got laptops and docks. So I'm sat in front of you. I've got two screens, a dock, a uh, keyboard mouse, and we've got the same setup at work. We've got three screens at work, actually. Same setup, same dock, everything. So we can work from home or work in the office. So I said to the guys, you know, work from home three weeks, three days next week and the week after. If you need to take docks or keyboards or even a desk home or a pedestal, um, stationary, whiteboards, whatever, whatever you need, just kind of set yourself at home and don't just work for a day because that's easy. Work from home two or three days, then come in on Friday and then go, right, I, I need this. I need a mouse rest for my wrists. You know, I need uh, another screen because i would realized they were, they were different or whatever. Yeah. So we spent two weeks basically getting everyone working from home three days per week, trying it all out. And, and then, of course, the lockdown was announced on the, I think it was the Monday. We only had five people in that day because everyone was still doing the three days thing. So the guys were like, it's just been on the news. There's going to be an announcement tonight. Uh, so I was like, right, what do we do? So first of all, we go over to the cafe at the science park. We all have bacon sandwiches. All right. So relax. Let's go and eat, you know, um, leaders eat last and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So there was like at the back of the queue. There was about five or six of us order loads of bacon sandwiches and coffees, sit in the science park. And I said, this is probably the last time we're going to do this for about probably six months. I said, it'll be, it'll be the end of summer at the earliest if we're lucky. So, cause the numbers are going to go up and up and up and then gradually down. So it's like a Gaussian distribution. It's going to, it's going to go one way and then the other. I said, it's going to be months. Yeah. Um, so we had the bacon sandwiches. We went in the office. We'd literally turned everything off like you do at Christmas, turned every single thing off. Um, obviously not the servers in the server room, which, <laughs> but now of course they're all cloud. So, yeah. you know, isn't it interesting four years later yeah. as there are no servers. Yeah. So, um, and the, the one exciting thing we did the week before that, Vicky and I, we'd got a, filing cabinet that we'd got all our well we haven't got much paper it was remember hong kong fui you're too young to remember hong no, kong I remember, i'm not I, I remember hong kong fui yeah absolutely. so hong kong fui filing cabinet with four drawers you open one <laughs> and you can't open the others right and vicky and i used to file stuff in there occasionally she would she and i were the only people that had the key for it okay so while we were sorting out all these projects on the 9th of march the the, the sort of the day where i my brain was melting came in and I said, right, everybody work in teams, look at the internet, look at Office 365, are we set up on teams properly? How are we going to communicate? How are we going to do our stand-ups? What time of day do we do things? Put a weekly town hall in on a Friday so we can all get together and just reflect on the week and reassure everybody, you know, it's all fine. And then Vicky and I spent a day or two shredding the whole of the filing cabinet 
I think we kept two bits of paper, mm. but it was all old contracts and NDAs and stuff. And of course you just build up over time. You don't. Yeah, yeah. So we literally entered this filing cabinet. I said, that's it. We're now paperless. And I've been dying to do this for like two years. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, when we went into the lockdown, I took the two printers home. We had a color printer on Vicky's desk and a black and white laser printer. And I took them home and put them in my garage. And I said, they're not going back in the office. And when we went in back in the, in the summer, about July time, I think it was, Vicky said, where's the printer? I said, oh, it's gone. And she said, well, I need it. So, well, you haven't had a printer since the 23rd of March. So that's, she said, okay. So we went paperless. And then what we'd done, we'd also refurbed the office and gone for slightly smaller desks and no pedestal underneath because we've got no paper now. So there's no folders, there's no paper. Yeah. We gave all the stationery to the local scout group and said, look, do you want all this post-it notes, pens and stuff? So we did quite a lot of business transformation, actually. We used it as an opportunity to transform the business and actually transform the office. My office actually disappeared. So I got rid of my office and turned it to a stand-up room. Okay. Because I'm out of the office two or three days a week, traveling, doing exhibitions, networking. So why is my little office sat there empty most of the week? Turn it so we put a high table in, whiteboard across the whole wall, TV in there, and it became a stand-up room. Yeah. So it was a really good opportunity to do things differently and go, right, okay, let's, let's do something. And also, rather than doing nothing and hiding and going, oh, my goodness, it's all going to be terrible, we were very positive about the future. It's another word to tick off, future. Um, are we going to get... You're going to be calling a house in a minute or what? Two, two more words. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and, and I wanted to show the staff as well, the employees that we were calm and that we're planning for the future. We're planning already for when we come back into an office. Don't know if it's going to be six months or six years, um, but there will be a future and we were, we were going to be ready for it. And so, you know, getting the office painted while it was empty, easy. The decorator was like, great. You know, go decorate it. Here's the key. Do it whenever you like. There's nobody there. Yeah. We had one of the network guys went in every day just to check on everything to make sure nothing had stopped or caught fire or smell of smoke or something. And I can remember giving him a letter written by me. So if the police stopped him, he could say, look, I'm genuinely going to an office to check on the IT and then going back home straight after. Crazy days, eh? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, what you, you know, you built, the previous company was, was Borwell. You know, mm -hmm. you built that up to quite a significant, size over over yeah. what 20 20, 20 plus, years yeah 20 years yeah so what what happened so i think we were services based doing big software projects and i think from 2020 onwards because they're expensive i think businesses just couldn't justify having a custom application written so they were either putting up with their excel spreadsheets and access databases and old systems and not buying you know their own where enterprise application. So the market for that slowed down very quickly. Mm. We were very lucky. We had a lot of work through 2020 and 2021, um, but that, that soon dried up. And then by 2022, I'd realized that the big old software project days were probably over, um, but we'd got Telecetra and we'd been, if we hadn't have had COVID and the pandemic, we would have focused more on Telecetra earlier, sooner. But it was a bit like sat in the cupboard ready to go when we were ready to focus on it. So right. I suppose we had about two years where we um, we weren't doing Telecetra. We were just ticking over, paying those quarterly payments, yeah. systemizing it. And so we were working on it in the background, but we weren't focused on it. Mm. All right. Over those 20 years, you must have um, learned a lot about managing people. Yes. The people side of the business. So what are, your, what are your top tips Top, Top tips. Learned. So I wrote some things down here. Um, so I've put here people, they will, they will never be me. I didn't realize this early on. Okay. I always thought when you hire someone, they're going to be a, like a clone of you. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, yeah. oh, this person's into the same things that I am or yeah. understands they're going to learn this stuff from me. Once they've been working with me three, six, 12 months, they're literally going to be my clone, but they're going to be even better because I'm going to make them polished and and they're younger so they're going to be like you know yeah. so after many years i think andrea probably told me about 800 times and other people told me the same they they will never be you they will never be you so tap into what they are good at and yeah. focus on that 
Yeah. And if you're, I'm, I'm quite meticulous about things, right? So I'm not OCD, but I'm, things have to be right, don't they? I'm an engineer. You can't have a, this is 99% okay. How's the new bridge you just built? Yeah, yeah it's 98% finished. Right, is it open? Yeah, just open it, see what happens. Yeah. What do you mean 98%? <laughs> it's it's got to be, you know. So, so the stuff we do technically, it has to be 100%. It, it is, there's no question, right? So, so they're never going to be me. They're never going to be, that but there'll be something else they might be oh i love spreadsheets and adding numbers up brilliant if they're blue fantastic say hey i've got a memory stick in here with 38 uh, databases on it from a customer they were wondering if we could rationalize this uh, have a look and of course if you're a blue person that's like you know that's yeah. like a kid in a sweet shop for me it's a nightmare for hard work. so it was a case of when you hired people trying to find out we, we always did the blue the personality styles you know the red green blue yellow yeah. and the belbin roles um and signature strengths as well you know it's what are people's signature strengths okay. so we would do that put it on the internet and we had a board as well with people's photos on where they were green yellow red okay. blue. okay yeah great and and it wasn't the case of like your blue it was a case of okay your blue great celebrate the blue if we've got an analytical project on a new thing give the data to the blue people say to them you have to time box them because they'll be there like spot working on it for like three light years um <laughs> could you spend no more than two days looking at these 38 databases and see is it possible to rationalize it don't start rationalize it because it's like weeks of work but just have a look see and just say yes we could do that or actually no it's going to be you know n squared problem um if they're green they're into process andrew is very much a, a green what's the process if i give andrew a blank piece of paper she's like i'm i like blank paper i'm like Woo blank paper let's start and build something right yeah. so I learned over the years, um, and to be fair, Jennifer Appleton recommended a book to me. Um, in fact, it's up here. Um, it's Surrounded by Idiots. I don't know if you've... Okay. Yeah, I so know of it. I, don't, I haven't read it, but yeah. So basically, you're the idiot, right? Yeah. So you're yeah, surrounded by people that are not yellow. Yeah. I'm yellow, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm surrounded by green, red, blue people who I think are idiots. No, no. Yeah. They're different to me. I'm the idiot for not realizing that. So you go, ooh, isn't it good? We've got a team with four different people on with four different personalities. Wow, that team in theory should be able to solve any problem, analyze any problem, work out a process, and then make sure all the people are happy and communicate it. Oh, isn't that a high-functioning, non-dysfunctional team? Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. So that's what I learned about people is understand the differences in the people and then just focus on the, the, the kind of the strengths, the strengths. then. Yeah, mm. and and um, yeah, find identify their flame and uh, and and fan it. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, good. And um, um, what about um, you know, you've 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 been up to um, tens of tens of people. What about managing them and and from a making sure that we're we're getting the operational side of the business done, the execution side of the business, and we're keeping control of things as well as the lovely blue sky strategy stuff but mm. but actually getting things done yeah that's really hard i think we got to about 28 people we put an ops manager in place and that was a bit of a disaster because yeah. they had their own agenda uh and uh, <laughs> and i wanted that ops manager to become my coo and then eventually become the ceo and i retire effectively and hand over right but um that didn't work out and i think what that the, there's leaders, managers, and executors. So, you know, executives, doers. And I think people confuse leadership and management. And I bet you've seen this all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and the problem we had is we, I'm, I'm a leader, clearly. I didn't know I was, but I, I'm just, this is the direction we're going. I've, I've scouted the hills and Andrea often says, where's Steve? Oh, he's over the Malvern Hills, running to Hereford. He's heard of some new thing and he's, he's out there. And he'll come scurrying back tomorrow. Hey guys, I've just found a new area of like the world that nobody's discovered. It's incredible, you know? Um, and then you have to sit down with your manager and say, right, we found this new area Southwest of the Malverns. It's incredible. Um, this is some photos. This is what's good. I'm excited about it compared to the other areas. Now the managers need to manage the team to, to, you know, it's the old thing. If you want to go fast, go alone. Go. If you want to go far, go together. Right. So, how do we go together and move everybody to that place? And I think what we have, we in this country, probably globally, we have a lack of managers 
but can actually listen to the leader's strategy, vision, get excited by it, and then go, okay, how do I break that down into daily, weekly, monthly things that the team will understand and can do, but we're moving step by step, Lego brick by Lego brick to building a skyscraper. Yeah. And and I think I failed on hiring people that had management potential or management ability right. or said they had <laughs> and paid yeah. very good salaries to them. But yeah. when you started looking at the work they were doing and bearing in mind, their focus was only this one part of the business. Yeah. They weren't doing some of the basics. I mean, really basic stuff, actually. It's quite surprising. How would you, you know, if you had your time again there, how would you, how, how would you head that off at the pass? So I think what I've done now is naturally set up a separate company for the cyber team and the software team. So I'm managing a, myself and five other people. Keelan and James are managing four people, including themselves. If we set up an IT service provider, I'd hire another person to work with Jacob to run that. And then they might grow that from two to three to four or five people. So I think it's a, I wouldn't divide and conquer is very okay. bad thing, but I think running smaller focused yeah. businesses yeah. rather than one bigger business with divisions effectively. Yeah. Yeah. And it just gets complicated very quickly. And, you know, you've yeah. got middle so, managers so in place. Sort of coming back to that sort of ideal team, team size. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 And, and um, there's lots of parallels to the military there, aren't there, as well as, as to size of units and squads and all those sort of things. And we, we call ourselves a squad. We say right. we're an agile squad. Yeah. You know? So we've got the software team. We work as two, three, four, five people typically. So we talk to a customer and say, look, we can put an agile squad together for you. It'll be a minimum of two people, obviously, of risk reasons. I will probably put myself in as a scrum master an hour or two a day, just so you've got a bit of top cover, a bit of yeah. someone listening going, that sounds really complicated. Why are the guys not worried about that? Yeah. Or the customer says something, we go, mm, they're exp expecting this. Has anyone told them that it won't do that? Because, you know, so we work in agile squads and the cyber team is saying they pair up on everything. They're very team focused. So I think we've become a squad of squads rather than one big company yeah. with lots yeah. of sub things that need meet managing yeah, I, I think it's a great way to scale a business is is in those squads, pods, whatever you want, whatever you want to call yeah, them. Pods is but, another but, good word. But you yeah. know, yeah, somewhere, somewhere five, six, five, six people, some, some, something like that, maximum, yeah. really, where where you've got you've got enough strength in depth, enough um, yeah. different perspectives as well, but but not so many that communication becomes a problem or people yeah. can hide, I suppose, as well with with it within that. But mm. um, yeah, everybody can be very clear on their yeah. on their on their roles. Yeah. Good. Well, I reckon that we could probably talk for another hour, Steve. We haven't. I don't think we've ticked off all of your all of your words on your word bingo yet. Um, so maybe if there's one, if there's two words left, we should know what they are and, and decide yeah. whether we're going to talk about them. Otherwise, we'll move to sort of just closing down questions. But what's what's on there then? Well, I think this has been a super opportunity. So super is another word. Okay. And um, I think it's amazing talking about some of the things I've learned and reflecting on those and hopefully it helps other people just reflect on some of their challenges, which are probably similar um, and trying to turn the, the challenges into opportunities and the, yeah. the failure into learning. So yeah. there you go. We've Absolutely. now ticked off my seven. So bingo. Brilliant. Fantastic. So if we're, if we're still around in five years time, Steve, what, what and we're meeting up for this, what, what does good look like for you? What has to have happened in those five years for you to call them a success? So I think I would have probably got a marketing and salesperson that really gets it uh, and is a, either working across both businesses or maybe just picks one of the two at the moment and says, I'll just focus on that one and sell that stuff. Thank you. Do that. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, I think there will be a third business to do with technology, whether it's a product or an IT managed service provider, because there are, you know, computers and mo even mobile phones in businesses they're not managed very well these devices need looking after need managing they get lost they get broken they get hacked into so there are basic opportunities to do better with the it we've already got so i think that would be that and i think hopefully i'd be working four days a week i'm now working five days a week right Which i used to do yeah i used to do six or seven i actually yeah. did nine in one month two years ago and and when you're doing your time sheets we all fill in time sheets so we can track our time um i just this is ludicrous i worked a 9.2 day week who else would do that yeah so i'm now doing a 37 and a half hour week and i actually two months ago i paid myself overtime for the hours i've done extra oh yeah nice yeah brilliant so, good so down to down to down to four by then okay yes. yeah good 
well. You all right for a couple of quick fire questions before we yes. close? Yeah. So if you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give the younger Stephen? Yeah, do everything. Yeah, to keep. Yeah, and I, I kind of, I've always said yes to opportunities to travel or stay at people's houses or go out. So say to everything yes, unless it's illegal. So right. there's a good film about that, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> the guy that said yes to everything. Yeah. yeah, good. Any learning resources that you'd recommend? You've recommended one book already. Any other books or podcasts oh. or? So yeah, these books we've read. All these books behind me have all been read. To pick so, out one or um, two. Atomic Habits, James yep. Clear. Yep. Um, Team of Teams, General McChrystal. Okay. That's brilliant. Very good. That's really good. And again, he was like, why have we got maps of Iraq up all around the wall? These guys don't care about geography. They're networks of people with mobile phones connected. So it became link analysis. It was like, this person's connected to this person. This phone was adjacent to that phone. That phone's been seen with this person. That means, therefore, this person is in the area, right? Yeah. So right. that's a good one. Um Obviously, Infinite Game, Simon Sinek, and Start With Why. Yeah. All of Simon Sinek's are yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. All right. Good. That's, yeah. a good. that's a good start for 10. And what about on the technology side? Any particular apps that you that you would recommend to, or bits of tech, tech that you'd recommend to other business owners? Yeah. So we, even though we're a software company, we build software, it's a last resort to build any custom code because it's really expensive to do and, it's, and it obviously needs maintaining. So we use a lot of off-the-shelf software, which might surprise a lot of people. They might think we build our own system mm -hmm. to do everything, right? So we use a thing called Harvest for timesheets. Okay. It's really simple to use. We use Zero with the X for all yeah. about, I yeah, mean, too. not being funny, I spend, like I said earlier, minutes in the morning reconciling the bank and doing invoicing and well, it does mm -hmm. itself. Our invoices are recurring. So yep. they, they send themselves yep. out, right? Yep. So, so brilliant. Um, we also use um, what well, was called Really Simple Systems CRM. It's now called Spotler. And it's, a, it's like 20 quid a month sort of thing, a CRM system. And it's literally ad accounts, which is customers uh, and contacts and tasks and actions and yep. opportunities with values and what needs doing. Really simple oh, to use. Brilliant. Office 365. Yep. Obviously, we've, we're a completely um, Office 365 cloud-based um, teams. So lots of people think teams is for making phone calls and meetings, right? There's so much more to it. Um, so we use teams really collaboratively. Uh, and my advice to people is try to stop using email. When you start engaging with a supplier or customer, set up a team site, invite them in as a guest and collaborate in that secure bubble. And we say to people, do not send any more emails, yeah. use teams in there. Um, and again, from a security perspective, everything inside that bubble, only the people in there have been invited. At the end of the project, you can delete the team and, and it's all gone. So email, uh, I assume all the emails I send are being read by people that have hacked into the server that it's going through. Right. Okay. So, so stop using email. And also you'll get less phishing attacks because if you've got lots of emails, you're hurriedly trying to go through them to yeah. find the ones that yeah. are valuable yeah. and you yeah. accidentally click on a link and do something and then, oh dear. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. Who's had the most influence on you, would you say, as a, as a business leader? Cool. That's a, that's a great one. There's this guy called Kevin Brenton. No, so. <laughs> it's probably numerous people. I mean, I was lucky because back in 2011, I applied on the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. Yeah. Um, and that, wow, I had six people. You know, on Dragon's Den, they have the so had six people asking me questions about the business, the business plan, the marketing, my numbers and everything. It was a real brilliant wow. Yeah. Anyway, I managed to get a place on there. And that was like doing an MBA in about eight months. Um, the one person that stands out from that is, I call him Dr. Cashflow. He's Matt Davis from Aston University. He, he, we had the, every Thursday we had to go to Aston Uni for the program. And there were these finance workshops as well that we we also had to do. And I don't think they told us about them in advance because people would have gone, right, every Thursday and also these other days. <laughs> and we've got to do a growth plan and meet as a cohort and meet our growth leader. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So anyway, we did this uh, finance workshop and it's brilliant. I mean, bearing in mind, you know, Andrea was a music teacher and I'm sort of electronics and software. And you've got things like balance sheets. And we used to print them out of Sage and sort of, go okay the balance sheet don't understand it yeah, that uh, one's carry heavier on. than that one so yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and we we were always cash positive so we paid all our bills and and we never had like run out of money or had got overdraft or overdrawn or anything so 
Matt had these strips of things like debtors, creditors, cash, whatever. And the first thing we had to do is take these plastic strips and put them in the order of the balance sheet. So are they an asset or liability? Yeah. And you've got things like they like stock and you go, well, I don't know, is that, what, what's that? What's stock, yeah. you know? So it was basic stuff like that. And he had this really good way of disarming us from not understanding real basics of business, but yeah. they know that we're all businesses running and we're technical or we're, we're expert in whatever, but we don't. So we learned how to read balance sheets. And he was the one that said to me about, well, there was probably about 12 of us in this workshop. And he said, who has a cash flow forecast? So three people put their hands up. And the rest of us sat there and went, oh, we're naughty. We haven't got one. Yeah. And he asked these people, what have you got? Oh, monthly cash flow, weekly cash flow. And this one lady, we've got daily cash flow. And we're like, wow, we haven't even got any cash flow. Yeah. So, so I said, well, why do we need to do one of these? I, I've been in business like 10, 12 years. And, you know, have I, have I just got lucky? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said, Steve, you need to do a cash flow forecast to prove to me you don't need a cash flow fork okay i get it okay i get it he said and also if you ever have a massive opportunity where you win a big piece of work and you have to hire 10 people like tomorrow you need to go and borrow money from a bank temporarily it might even just be for a few months right they will ask you for a cash flow if you can show them two or three years cash flow forecast all positive in detail they'll go you know what you're doing and lend you the money if you don't they'll turn you on your tail and say come back with a business plan and a cash flow so i said okay so we we need to do it just when we don't need it but when we need it and of course when covid kicked in it was really useful seeing what really was going on yeah yeah absolutely good and um final final of these quick fire questions what's what's your most successful lead generation tactic for finding new customers what works for you so working closely with the existing cl- customers and when they say great things about you, get a testimonial off them right. because that's yeah. easy because they've just said it effectively and say, do you know anyone else that you play golf with or in your network that also would benefit from our software or cyber services? Because we would welcome two or three referrals. And if only one of those turns out to be, but that would be amazing. Thank you very much. So I think it's easier when they compliment you, you kind of use it as an opportunity to go, well, why wouldn't they... If you went to a restaurant tonight and it was really good, you'd tell people, wouldn't you? Yeah. It's the same as that. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Brilliant. Stephen, it's been fascinating having you on. I'm glad that we finally hooked up and got it got it sorted. If people would like to contact you or find out more about Telecessor or Cybex, mm-hmm. what's the best way for them to do that? Probably if you go on LinkedIn, that's my main platform I use. If you go on LinkedIn, you'll find me on there um, or search for Telecessor. And it's telecoms, et cetera. But because it's quite difficult to spell, just go on LinkedIn, look for Steve Borwell, and you'll, you'll find me on Perfect. there. That would be great. And I'd welcome – I'm happy to help anybody that's got any technology, things they're buying or doing, happy to talk them through it before they go and make a decision with a, with a vendor or a, a business, right? Because we might have a few questions we can give them. Say, ask these as well just to, right. just to make sure. Yeah. Brilliant. Steve, thank you very much indeed for being my guest on Skelet Radio today. No, thank you. It's been a super opportunity. Thank you, Kevin. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. And if you're building and scaling your own business, you might well be interested in our book, The Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a practical handbook around scaling a business in a structured way. And you can order a copy on all your favorite online retailers, including an audio version, or you can find it and other supporting resources on our website, www.esusgroup.co.uk. That's esusgroup.co.uk, which is E-S-U-S-G-R-O-U-P.co.uk. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.